called the GoGo -Go interaction technique, which was inspired by Inspector Gadget. Uh, and the GoGo -Go interaction technique, within a certain distance uh, from my, my body to, to so, some distance D, let's say, I can do simple manipulation. But then when I surpass that, then my hand exponentially goes farther out into the environment to be able to select anything in the room. Once we hit our threshold D, we start to increase the distance of the hand. Right? So we can go ahead and select objects way in distance. Right? And he is simply extending his hand outward, but we're using that non-isomorphic function to move the cursor as far as we possibly can. So with the flashlight, what we do is we effectively um, instead of using an actual ray, we're going to use a conic section volume. And that allows you to basically be a little bit less precise in doing selection of objects. That you have to choose the object that's closer to the center line. All right, so here's the flashlight technique. And you can see the objects are really far away. It'd be very hard to pick, to pick one with a ray. But I can go ahead and pick them with the flashlight. I'm just choosing the one in the center. Um, now, aperture selection is an extension to the flashlight technique, and the difference is, is that the user can interactively control the spread of the selection volume. And here's aperture selection. You, so you can see the, the, the ray or the, the selection aperture is changing. He's changing it dynamically depending on how, you know, how he feels comfortable in, in actually doing the selection. Sometimes he may need a small aperture, sometimes he may need a large aperture. It depends on the situation. So here's an example of that. So you can see the white cube represents that marker. And I simply use uh, another part of the input device to cycle through the objects that I want. So even though I may have some occlusion, I can go ahead and simply use that extra piece of, of, of hardware, if you will, to uh, select objects that are behind other objects. Select something. The cursor goes to the object. I can translate and rotate it. All right? I want to do something else? The ob cursor goes to that object. All right? Do the ray casting. Cursor goes to the object. I can do my selection and manipulate selection and, and manipulation using uh, basically direct manipulation. So here's scale, scale world grab, and it looks very much like image plane. So it just gives me a selection of objects, and I can select the one that I want. This is a good example of bimanual control with two sixth off degrees of freedom. And actually, the trigger controls the rotation speed like a lathe on the left hand. So you're, uh, you have like a tool in your right hand and an object in your left hand. And that's a really great kind of combination, because you can manipulate the tool, or you can rotate the object. And down you see these kind of nicely rendered hands, which are gloves. You're supposed to be a thief, so you have these kind of leather gloves. You can reach out. You're in a car. You're not driving. He's driving. You can pick up objects. This is one of the experiences which is in a, one of our bundles that comes with PlayStation VR. You can reach out and turn on the radio. And um, yeah, almost every, like I said, you can see if it's kind of got a red and so this game gets, you know, a little bit more intense. Uh, there's a, at, at some point, the, um, yeah. <laughs> so you, you eventually get a gun and you do some kind of two-handed interactions. Next slide. So why was that scene so popular? I, with most of the people who tried that demonstration really got excited about VR, and especially the gamers. And I think it's partly because First of all, you're sitting in a chair doing this experience. In the car, you're sitting. So you have this matched affordance. You feel like you're doing the same thing with the rest of your body. The controls were really simple, just one trigger for each hand, just a grab. That's all you had, and very literal grab. It was very busy. There's a lot of things to do, and uh, it gets to be very intense. There's kind of this fight or flight, if I don't do something, I will die kind of situation. And that kind of raises the stakes. There was a talk about this at Sigraph a couple days ago, or yes, and about how having high stakes makes you more engaged uh, by the limit, limitless people. Um, there's lots of interactive stuff within arm's reach, so there's all these things you can do, like the, the dials and things, and the, you can actually open the door of the car. And uh, 
one of the really interesting things I think is when you go to like, grab the dial and you turn it, when you, when you grab, your hand actually moves into the reference frame of the dial at that moment. It actually kind of, it does it seamlessly, transitions, but now all you can do with your hand while grabbing the dial is rotate. There's nothing else that hand can do except for rotate in that one axis. Same thing when you grab the little thing on the glove box or the thing above the windshield. After you've grabbed it, you're, you're constrained to the degree of freedom that the thing you're grabbing has. However, when you grab a free object, then the object moves into your hand, and now you still have one-to-one -one mapping of your hand during that time, and then the hand pose conforms around that object, so they have to do special animations for, that, for each object. So it's a little bit of extra work, but I think it gives a really great effect for when you're interacting with things. So there's um, a lot of bimanual interaction. You can pick objects up and you can switch hands with them, but you also eventually get a gun and ammunition, and the real only way to load the gun is to have one hand have the ammunition and the other hand have the gun and put them together, so you have to use two hands together. And there's other things. People get really good at using their hands together. There's, there's a door where you can open up and lean out, and so people hold the door open, otherwise it closes, so they're doing multiple things with their hands at the same time. Uh, another thing we learn while watching people play is there's, there's a kind of a stash of ammunition to the side of you, which at first you look at it and everyone looks at it and sees it, but then after a while they don't even look anymore, they just reach over to where the ammunition is, grab it, and expect it to be grabbed by their hand. They, they just reach into this kind of bag that's next to them and pull out ammunition. And so if you're thinking about designing like an inside out tracking system where you only have tracking of your hands where you're looking, that would fail. You wouldn't be able to see your hand if you reach over there. So actually that could be a kind of an issue for some of the new tracking systems, I think. But there's a lot of things that I think that work there with the object permanence as well. First of all, you can reach in and you know that something will be there. You hear audio cues constantly. The person, the driver's constantly talking to you. That makes you feel like it's always there. And the, the car door also, you can reach over and grab it and open it without looking at it. So those kind of effects I think are important to implement, not just things that are on screen. That makes you believe in the world more. And the last thing, which is kind of classic for all games and works really well in VR, is you do something small and it turns into something big. In this particular game, you can shoot the tires out of the cars and the motorcycles and the thing will flip up and do a big giant explosion. So you do this very small thing and it turns into a very huge thing. And that works well in general. And that's why I think also physics works really well in VR because you can kind of do a small thing and it, the physics amplifies it into something. So again, you're doing bimanual interaction. You have one hand that has a mini world. And in the other hand, you have this little tiny hammer. And this little tiny hammer can reach into the world in miniature and zombies start to attack. And when you hit one of the zombies in the world of miniature, a giant hammer comes down and <laughs> smashes the zombies in the, the real sized world that you're in. So it's kind of a powerful metaphor always to have the miniature world and having it when you see the other player, his eyes, since they're being tracked, are also represented in his avatar. So here you can see, here's the other player. We're watching him. He's looking around. And you'll notice when his, his eyes kind of move in a much more realistic way, they're not just rigidly attached to his head like they would be. And uh, look at his own hand. And his eyes just very slightly narrow in on his hand. And we have really strong um, skills at noticing these kind of things. So I can really tell where somebody's looking by their virgins and things. So here I'll continue this on. You can see just at the very end when he looks at his hand, it's just a lot, I mean the whole thing suddenly feels like there's a person there. And they look around in a kind of way that makes sense. Their eyes move quicker than their head and their head moves quicker than their body. Um, they also don't see things that aren't within their field of view and they blink realistically. But kind of in a more important sense for VR and what Jason was saying earlier is that they really do the right thing for the player. It's a very human-centric thing. They should react to you the way you would expect. If you make a noise, they should turn and look. If you wave, they should turn and look. If you point at something, they should look at what you're pointing at. And also I mentioned the environment and other NPCs, but if you look on this, this page, the player is a huge portion of what they need to react to. So 
I, I mentioned if, if, you make, if you make noise or if you wave, if you point up, I don't know if you can see that, but if my hand, my virtual hand's pointing up at the ceiling. Also, if you, if you look at them and then look away, they'll turn and look at what you're looking at now. They're, they're interested in where you looked. And then if you stare at one of them, they'll hold your gaze. They won't just look away because once you show that you're interested in them, they stay interested back in you. So otherwise, if you're not looking at them, they'll look around and do whatever. But if you kind of get their attention and look at them, they'll stay connected to you. So yeah, we're going to take all that same exact thing. Hey, guys. <laughs> and so now, if you had something like cameras on your VR good. headset and you could see the real world through the cameras, <laughs> and then that video could also be processed so that you see faces in, it, in motion, and, it and then they'll react to the things in the video as well that is from the headset, then you can do something like an augmented reality version of all that same stuff. So that's future work and research area, not really at all product area.